let's start with the traditional invocation. If you like, you can join me. Om Bhadram Karne Bhishrinu Yama Devaha Bhadram Pashye Maksha Bhirya Jatraha Sthirai Rangai Stushta Vagam Sastanu Bhihi Vyashema Deva Hitai Yadayuhu Swastina Indra Vridha Shravaha Swastina Pusha Vishwa Vedaha Swasti nastarkshyo arishtanemihi Swasti no brihaspatir dadhatu Om shanti 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 Om, O oh gods, may we hear what is auspicious with our ears. May we see all auspicious things with our eyes while praising the gods with steady limbs. May we enjoy a life that is beneficial to the gods. May Indra of ancient fame be auspicious to us. May the supremely, the supreme all-knowing Pusha the, uh, be propitious to us. May Garuda, the destroyer of evil, be well disposed towards us. May Brihaspati ensure our welfare. Om, peace, peace, peace. Um, namaste, and it's wonderful to be back here in this beautiful atmosphere at the Shivananda Yogashram once again. Um, and the subject is the Mandukya Upanishads with the Mandukya Karika. This subject, it's, it's uh, actually the heart of Vedanta. Uh, it is properly in the path of knowledge, the, uh, the way of knowledge. You see, spirituality, it comes in different forms, different paths. Let's put it this way. There can be one approach which is based on devotion, the way of bhakti, of love. The distinguishing characteristic of which is that uh, we have devotion and faith in God. The way of love, of devotion, cannot start without faith. If from the very beginning you start questioning, why should I believe, then that's not the way for you. But if I can believe, if I can start with faith, with shraddha, then the way of devotion is very powerful. So there I believe and proceed. Most religions are like that. Most religious paths in all the major world religions, most of it is bhakti actually, devotion. But there comes another path, the path of yoga, which says, no, 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 not, a, not so much bhakti, but experience. Uh, when you come and do yoga here, whether it is the hatha yoga or the meditation, the raja yoga, uh, there it is not enough to say, I believe in yoga. Will I get the benefits? No, you have to do it. You've actually got to do it, then only you get the benefits. You have to do the Hatha Yoga to get the benefits for your health. You have to do the meditation to get the higher experiences promised in, in Raja, Raja Yoga. The path of Patanjali Yoga says, spirituality is not a, just a matter of belief, but it's a matter of experience. Practice these techniques this is the way you sit and breathe. This is the way you focus and visualize. And eventually, long, stabilized practice over a long period of time, dedicated practice, you will get the various mystic experiences promised in these texts. And that proves to us the truth of spirituality, that it's real. There's something, something in it. We actually experience it. That's the path of yoga, the path of experience. As distinguished from these, the path of belief and the path of experience. By the way, when I say path of belief, path of experience, path of knowledge, I'm not making a watertight compartment. In each of these paths, the others are also present. But predominantly, predominantly. So path of belief, path of experience. Now comes the path of knowledge, where the objective is no longer, is neither believing in something, nor is it getting extraordinary experiences, mystical experiences, but rather investigating our ordinary experience to discover the ultimate reality about ourselves. What do I mean by ordinary experience and mystic experience? I have had the vision of uh, Kali or Jesus, mystic experience. Most of us don't have it, suppose. Uh, it's, it's limited to a few. Not only limited to a few, even those mystics 
for them it comes and goes it it was not constant it came as a result of intense spiritual practice so those are mystic experiences rare very valuable very valuable rare but in the path of knowledge what is used is reasoning inquiry inquiry into what investigation into what into our experience daily experience something that everybody has in this upanishad we'll take up the experience of waking dreaming deep sleep who does not have these experiences we are all awake all at least most of us because vedanta occupational hazard is it immediately takes you into the state of dreaming or deep sleep <laughs> but stay awake for the duration um so these experiences serve as the material for investigation so in the path of knowledge it's not a question of belief it's not even a question of getting certain specific mystical experiences but rather investigating the daily experience of li- living and thereby discovering the ultimate see ultimately in all of these paths it is promised that there is something to be found call it god or brahman or nirvana whatever you call it the common factor in all paths of spirituality there is a claim that there is something to be found by finding which realizing which seeing which attaining which we go beyond suffering dukkha nivritti the cessation of suffering this is the this is the promise of spirituality at a temporary level we get it in the world through all kinds of both secular and um, other kinds of practice but ultimately the buddha's quest to go beyond suffering completely that is the path of spirituality attainment of lasting and profound peace and joy and going beyond suffering path of knowledge um swami brahmananda shared a nice anecdote with me about carl jung the great psychoanalyst towards the end of his life he was interviewed by bbc and he was asked do you believe in god he said i do not believe in god i know god you see i do not believe in god i know god believe in god path of love and devotion i know god that is the culmination of the path of knowledge so the, what we are going to talk about here it lies firmly in the path of knowledge so in the next few classes that's what i'm going to talk about now this was just to make things clear about what we are going to do here if you ask so are you saying we should abandon our devotional practices and meditation and all and all do the path of knowledge which is the better path which one should we follow the answer is all of them all of them all the great teachers of sanatana dharma never excluded any path devotion meditation indeed service karma yoga which many of us we are doing i see so much karma yoga going around here service and knowledge gyana yoga all of them are components to a wholesome spiritual life it's just that different masters different spiritual teachers um had a different mix of these so for example shankara the great teacher of non dualism whose text we are going to take up shankara he kept knowledge at the top but you start with um karma with action karma yoga and proceed to upasana or raja yoga and bhakti yoga meditation and then finally gyana yoga the path of knowledge by karma according to shankara in shankara structure by karma yoga one gets purification of mind with a purified mind when you meditate you get a concentrated mind and when we have a pure and concentrated mind and we come to this the path of knowledge then by the path of gyana yoga knowledge arises ignorance is removed and we get enlightenment and liberation karma yoga removes impurities of the mind raja yoga or meditation removes the distractions of the mind and finally gyana yoga the path of knowledge removes ignorance from the mind that shankara structure so you can clearly see he is privileging knowledge above all others but others are not excluded they are preparatory if you come to a teacher like ramanuja who lived about 1000 years ago um there almost the same structure action first but then knowledge second higher than action is knowledge but higher than knowledge is love 
So in his path, love comes at the highest. Outermost action, inner to that is knowledge, inner, innermost is love. But you see, my point is, all the great teachers included all of these paths. Here, today, just now, notice the session. You had Hatha Yoga exercises before this, which is action. Then you had meditation, which is Raja Yoga. Then you had chanting, which is a practice of Bhakti Yoga. Now we are doing the path of knowledge. See, all of them are included. Um, by tradition, this lineage, which is a common lineage to us also, uh, Swami Vishnu Devanandaji and Swami Shivanandaji, they belong to the Saraswati lineage. And that's a, that's a knowledge lineage, that's a, a Vedanta lineage, going all the way back to Shankara. So this text is definitely a text which is a foundational text of this lineage. What more do I want to say? I can put it in another way, slightly different way. The spiritual journey in this path, this path we are going to take up, the spiritual journey is not a journey from one place to another. What do I mean by one place to another? Say, what is religion? It takes you from earth to heaven. Uh, where is God? Not here, there. You see, there is a place word, a journey in space. Not here, but there. Vedanta is not about that. What Vedanta is talking about is both here and there and everywhere. So it's right here. It's not about a journey in time. When will I see God? After death. In America, you sometimes come across these big billboards. After death, black, very ominous. After death, you will see God. Call 1-800 for the truth or something. <laughs> after death. But notice the word after. After is a time word. When do you see God? Not now. After death. Post-mortem spirituality. Now, 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 I am not denying that such things are possible. Are there such worlds which you can call a heaven? I'm quite sure there are. Is it possible to have visions of God after death? I'm quite sure it's possible. I'm sure people do have. But Vedanta is not talking about that. It's not a journey in time also, from now to then. No. What Vedanta is talking about was in the past, is now, and will be in the future also. It is... It, it is everywhere and all the time and right here and right now. So what is it a journey? If it's not a journey in space, it's not going somewhere or it's not waiting for something to happen, then what kind of a journey is it? It's a journey from ignorance to knowledge. When Carl Jung says, I know God, it's a journey from I don't know to I know. So this is the path of knowledge. What is the role of these texts? What do the Upanishads do? Let me tell you a little experience. As you heard, I have, I have had the privilege of being in Boston the last few months. And, and the university has given me a nice apartment on uh, the highest floor of the building. It's the 20th floor. And from there, when I open the window shades in the morning, I can see the Charles River. And opposite is um, this building, which I did not know, this whole campus, which I did not know. I would see it every day. It's actually the Harvard Business School. But the f funny thing was, you know, when I went there, there are certain things I wanted to see. I, I had heard of the Harvard Business School. It's the best business school in the world. So I should go someday and see it. Even every day when I would open the window and look at that also, I would think, one day I should go and see the Harvard Business School. Never realizing I was looking at it directly. <laughs> there. One day I was walking and I went to that area and, uh, and I was thinking, oh, very nice. What is all this? Which I saw every day. And I asked a lady, what are these buildings? Are they part of the university? And she said, it's the Harvard Business School. Oh, this is the Harvard Business School. Now I know. Did I see something new? No. I saw it every day. But now I know this is the Harvard Business School. Now, what did it take for me to know this? To see the, what did it take for me to see, within quotes, the Harvard Business School? I said told this story to somebody back in New York. And um, uh, they said, oh, you have to open the window shades. But no. Every day I was opening the window shades. Every day I was looking also. Just by opening the window shades, I did not know. Then what, what helped? What actually tipped the balance? That lady had to say, this is the Harvard Business School. Then I knew. 
something which is continuously experienced, and yet we miss it. It has to be introduced to us. It has to be pointed out to us. The Upanishad does that. There is something which we, it's already there in our experience all the time. When we become enlightened, do you know what the experience will be? Oh, I did not realize that I am the Atman, pure consciousness. Now I see it. I was the body and mind earlier. Now I am pure consciousness. No, 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 no. We will feel, oh my God, it was always there. I never saw it. It was always there all the time when I didn't even know anything about Vedanta. When I knew about Vedanta, when I tried my utmost to try to realize this, I was always experiencing it. In fact, there's no possibility of experiencing anything else. People who don't know the first thing about Vedanta, people who are not at all interested, the most materialistic person, everybody, all the time, it's always there. It has to be introduced to us. These texts do it. These Upanishads are part of the Vedas, which are a very ancient collection of uh, religious, spiritual texts, um, the fundamental texts of Hinduism. Even by modern scholarship, they are <coughs> maybe 3,000 or more years old. And the Upanishads are the final teachings. Don't worry about what the Vedas say, because you're going to get the, the essence in the Upanishads. Upanishads are many in number, large and small. The biggest of them, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, is a vast text. The smallest of them is this one, which we are going to do, the Mandukya Upanishad. It has only 12 mantras, the shortest. It is the shortest of the Upanishads and the most powerful. It is the most packed with pointer. The pointer which will say, not this is Harvard Business School, this is your real nature. This is the Atman. Here, you are experiencing it. See it for yourself and be free. There is a nice story of Ramachandra and Hanuman. There is Hanuman there. And Rama and Sita in his heart. So Hanuman uh, asks Ramachandra once, how can I attain moksha, spiritual freedom, going beyond suffering? And how can I attain that? And Ramachandra says, Mandukya mekam evalam mumukshunam vimuktai. This Upanishad, the Mandukya Upanishad, by itself is sufficient to give liberation to those who seek it. Ramachandra says this, no better advertisement, that this by itself is sufficient. But suppose I don't get um, liberation after the classes are over, I'm not yet liberated, then, then Ramachandra gives to Hanuman a list of 108 Upanishads. You better study those then. So that's why we have to be very alert in these classes and let's try to quickly get liberation by studying this shortest and most powerful of Upanishads. Otherwise, 108 Upanishads. <laughs> so the Mandukya Upanishad, which is part of the Atharva Veda, um, shortest Upanishad. One more point I would like to add before we enter the text directly. Um, the Upanishad itself is very short, 12 mantras only. Uh, Shankaracharya, who is the great commentator on the Upanishads and is at the source of our common lineage, Adi Shankaracharya, who lived about 1400 years, 1300 years ago in India. He wrote commentaries on these Upanishads and thanks to him, we are able to understand these Upanishads. Um, I remember in our classes at Harvard University in Divinity School, we were studying the Upanishads and the attempt was to study them directly without the help of commentaries. It's not, particular, not very uh, easy. But anyway, and the professor would again and again say, I'm trying to keep Shankara out of the door. Because once he enters, then everything <laughs> follows in lockstep with Shankara. So, so that was his influence. Um, it's thanks to his commentaries that these Upanishads, sometimes they seem very difficult and cryptic, but they open up their treasures because of his commentaries. Now, before Shankara, Shankara's guru's guru, Gaudapada Acharya, who was Shankara's guru was Govindapada and Govindapada's guru was Gaudapada. So Gaudapada Acharya, Shankara's guru's guru, himself wrote a commentary on this Upanishad. So his commentary, which is in the form of Sanskrit verses, like poetry, um, is called the Mandukya Karika. Karika means verses. So there is the Mandukya Upanishad and explaining the 12 Upanishads are the Mandukya Karika, the verses, 
And those verses are divided into four chapters. Chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. The first chapter is what we are going to take a look at here. The first chapter contains the entire Upanishad, which is only those 12 mantras, and certain karikas composed by Gaurapada, Shankara's teacher's teacher. Very profound, very powerful, non-dualistic teacher. And also, I'll be drawing on Shankara's commentary. I will not present you with directly with the Sanskrit of Shankara's commentary, but what you'll be hearing from me is basically Shankara's commentary. Shankara wrote a commentary on the Upanishads and on the Karikas, his teacher's teacher's work. So that is the structure of the text. Upanishad, so nowadays if you study the Mandukya Upanishad, this is how you normally study it. The Upanishad, the four chapters of the Karikas, and Shankara's commentary on the whole thing. The Upanishads in one voice proclaim that there is an ultimate reality. They usually call it Brahman, but other words also, Purusha, whatnot. Simply sometimes that. So an ultimate reality. And this reality is pure being, pure consciousness, pure bliss. May sound very abstract, but the Upanishad says, this ultimate reality is our real nature. That's who or what we really are. Because we do not know it, we think of ourselves as these little creatures of flesh and blood, born today, dying tomorrow, suf suffering in so many ways, and ever unfulfilled. We think of ourselves as that, whereas we are actually infinite. I love this saying that um, we think we are human beings in search of spiritual experience, but the truth is that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. That's very nice. And that's what the Upanishads mean. They, they would just replace it instead of saying we are spiritual beings, it would say we are spiritual being in the singular. We are all one spiritual reality called Brahman. And all the Upanishads have different ways of pointing it out to us. Remember, this is Harvard Business School, pointing it out to us. We are already experiencing it. As we shall see, it's not talking about a single thing beyond our experience. But it points it out to us. You think, is, is that so easy? Just point it out to us and I know, okay, I am one with God, I am Brahman, I am the absolute, done, finished with life. Probably not, otherwise there would be many more enlightened people walking around. The trick is in the fine print because they want a certain preparation of mind and body, a certain purity and certain ability to focus and uh, dispassion. When we madly run after things in the world, we tend to miss the background. It's an ever-present background. It's always there. But we miss it because we're looking for... We miss the screen because we're so engrossed in the movie. The screen is always there. Without the screen, no movie. But we are so delighted with the movie. We, say, we, we laugh and we cry and we are terrified. If it's a good movie, good comedy movie, good tragedy, good horror. So we are scared. We cry. We laugh. We are engrossed in the movie. All the time it is light and screen. That's all. But we miss it. How do we miss it? it talk, today I was talking about this. Um, I've had the experience of living in the past three years. have been very interesting for me. I lived in Hollywood for one year. And then in Manhattan. Uh, and now at Harvard. You have fame and glamour and all of that. That's the, in Hollywood, the biggest people are the stars, not the night stars, the Hollywood stars. So they are the famous. If you're famous, you've made it. And in Manhattan, Wall Street, if you're, if you're rich, money is very important. So you have to make it means you have to be a millionaire or a billionaire. And at Harvard, it is learning. It's uh, at the top of the food chain are the Nobel Prize winners. And so you have fame and uh, glamour, you have money, and you have learning. Some of the most important ingredients of what people think, if I have those, I will be happy. I will be fulfilled. This is the goal of life. One thing I observed, if people have a spiritual quest, along with that, Glamour or money or learning, all very good. Even better and better and better. But without that spiritual quest, it could be in any form. It could be devotion, it could be service, it could be philosophy, it could be meditativeness, whatever it is. A spiritual quest, if it is not there, then the rest are meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. 
It takes time to realize. The world is mad after these things. Sense pleasure and money and fame. And we think that we'll be very happy with that. And temporarily, like a band-aid, it works. But not, not for long. Deep satisfaction is possible through spirituality alone. This is my reading. This all the texts tell us, but it's good to see it for yourself. It's good to see it for yourself. Sri Ramakrishna put it this way. Line up as many zeros as you will. Still the value is zero. But put one and then add, add zeros, the value keeps on increasing. The one is, call it God, spirituality, uh, and uh, self-realization, whatever you call it. That core spirituality, if it's there, everything in this, else in the world adds to it. Everything is better. But without that one, everything is empty. You cannot fill up. There's no fulfillment possible. There's no end to it. It's like a bottomless well. So, okay, with that in mind, this is what we are trying to do. To discover our real nature and attain that ultimate fulfillment. Vedanta tells us, gives us the amazing news that what we are seeking for is already there. That ultimate reality. And it's you. You are that. That's why I say Vedanta is the most interesting subject in the world because it's about you. I am the most interesting subject in the world to myself only. Everybody else thinks I'm a bore. But it's about me. It's about ourselves, our innermost reality. So how does this proceed? Let's take up um, the first two mantras. Yes, there's verse one. So remember, 12 mantras. We'll take up the first two, and then I'll talk about it. You can chant after me if you like. Om Ittyetad, Om Ittyetad, Aksharam Idagam Sarvam, Aksharam Idagam Sarvam, Tasya Upabhyakyanam, Tasya Upabhyakyanam, Bhutam Bhavat, Bhutam Bhavat, Bhavishyaditi, Bhavishyaditi, Sarvam Omkara Eva, Sarvam Omkara Eva, Yacha Anyat, Yacha Anyat, Trikala Titam, Trikala Titam, Tadapyonkara Eva, Tadapyonkara Eva, Sarvam Yetat, verse number two. Sarvam Yetat, Brahma. I am Atma Brahma, I am Atma Brahma, so am Atma Chatushpat, so am Atma Chatushpat. All right, let's go back to verse 1. What does it say? Om Ittyeta Daksharam Idam Sarvam. It may all sound very strange at the beginning. Don't worry, by the end of uh, these classes, all will be. So you'll be like, um, that was so simple. Why didn't I get it earlier? Om Itteta Daksharam Idam Sarvam. It means Om, this mantra, is everything that is here. Everything that we know in life. The entirety of the universe is Om. I can see how. Don't worry. Pretty easy. We'll see soon. Om is everything in this universe. Tasya Upabhyakhyanam. Explanation of that and investigation of that. Bhutam bhavishyad, uh, bhutam bhavat bhavishyaditi sarvam onkara eva. Whatever is there in this world means whatever was there in the past, the entirety of the universe, whatever was there in the past, all the people and animals and beings and planets and stars, whichever existed in the past, all that is om. Bhavat, what is there right now? Everything that exists in the world, external, internal, all that is Om. And everything that can possibly come in the future, all that is Om. So everything in time is Om. What about something beyond time, something eternal? Yatcha Anyat, and that which is the other. Trikala Atitam, beyond the three, transcending the three periods of time, past, present and future. Brahman, the ultimate reality. Tadapya Omkareva, that too is Om. So whatever is within time is Om, and whatever, if there is something beyond time and eternal, that too is Om. And then the second mantra says, Sarvam Yetat Brahma. All of this, remember, all of this is, we said, Om, 
Now it says, no, all of this is Brahman, the ultimate reality. Uh-huh. And what is Brahman? I am Atma Brahma. This very self is Brahman. This very self, I am, means this. This. This very self is Brahman. I am Atma Brahma. Okay, we'll stop here. What, what have we got here? It all sounds very, very cryptic and... In America, they would say, it sounds cool, but what does it mean? (laughs) Vedanta proposes to reveal the secret of the universe, of everything. Everything that we see all around us. Uh, It just uses the uh, language of time. uh, To explain everything, it says, everything that ever existed, everything that does exist now, everything that can possibly exist in the future, all of that is within time. And everything within time is Brahman. It is that ultimate reality, Brahman. And everything beyond time is also that absolute reality, Brahman. Now to explain this, to understand this, the Upanishad starts inquiry. Two inquiries. One, an inquiry using Om. Why inquiry? Remember the background. This is the way of knowledge. So Upanishad does not say straight away, start meditating or go and do the dishes, karma yoga, or chant and sing. No, no. Inquiry. Inquiry into what? Two things. One is the Om, the mantra Om, we'll see later. And the second thing is an inquiry into the self, Atman. Why? Notice, to know the secret of everything, the entirety of the universe, is nothing other than Brahman, according to the Upanishad. And Brahman is nothing other than the self. So what is the self? You. It's talking about you. You are the, you are the, the, you, the self which, which we are. That itself is Brahman. And Brahman is the, the essence, the reality of the universe. Therefore, to do, know the reality of everything, you have to know Brahman. To know Brahman, you have to know yourself. Therefore, an inquiry into the self. Atma, Atma means self. By knowing the Atma, you know Brahman. By knowing Brahman, you know everything that there is to know. So, first inquiry, first investigation is into the self. Who am I? What am I? And that you find in just about almost every one of the Upanishads. What am I? Why? Because when we discover what we are, we'll discover the ultimate reality. And that's expressed in the second verse in the, it's called the Mahavakya, the great statement. I am Atma Brahma. This very self is Brahman. That short statement, this is very important in Advaita Vedanta. Conventionally, there are four statements all across the Upanishads. Four statements are taken as great sentences or Mahavakya, uh, the great um, propositions or, or statements. All of them mean the same thing. What do they mean? They mean you are the ultimate reality. So in the Chandogya Upanishad, we find Tattvamasi. Many people have heard of that. That thou art. Tattvamasi. In California, there was this gentleman who changed his name and called himself Tattvamasi. That thou art. That's from the Chandogya Upanishad. In the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, which I mentioned, the biggest of the Upanishads, there is this short sentence. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And in the Aitadi Upanishad, you come across the sentence, Pragyanam Brahma, this very awareness is Brahman. And here in this Upanishad, we just read, I am Atma Brahma, this very self is Brahman. Whether it is that thou art, or I am Brahman, or this very awareness within me is Brahman, or this very self is Brahman, do you see that it all means the same thing? It's pointing to one central truth. The identity of Atman and Brahman. The identity of the self and the cosmic. That I am one with the universe. But how can I understand this? It's easy to say it. We need an inquiry. And the inquiry is one inquiry into Om. Two inquiries are proposed here. One inquiry into Om. We'll see why. And the second one, the important one, the inquiry into the self. Inquiry into the self means let us investigate our experience of Ourselves. How do we experience ourselves? Look at our own experience and we will discover the ultimate truth. So that's the background. Um, How do you proceed here? The two inquiries, 
first Upanishad mentioned the Om inquiry, and now in the second verse it mentions the self inquiry. But first it will take up the self inquiry. So from the third mantra onwards up to the seventh mantra, it will talk about self inquiry. And that's where we will concentrate. And then from the eighth to the last, the twelfth mantra, it will bring back the Om inquiry and show how it is connected with the self inquiry. To repeat then, what do we have ahead of us? Mantra one and two introduced us to two kinds of inquiry. Inquiry into Om and inquiry into the self. The important one is the inquiry into the self. From the mantra number three to seven, inquiry into self. And mantra number eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, which we can we will take up in short order at the end, it's inquiry into Om. By that time, hopefully, all this will be clear, and a few at least will be enlightened. <laughs> Uh, I'm only half joking. It's quite possible. Prepared mind, anytime. It's like a, Sri Ramakrishna used to talk about a dry matchstick. If you strike it once, it bursts into flame. Compared to a wet and sodden matchstick. Keep on striking it, no flame. And it might even break. <laughs> so that preparation, if one has the preparation, little bit of pointing, this is Harvard Business School. It took a lot of preparation for me because a long time I'd been thinking, I must go and see it one day. So... That prepared mind, when you point it out, ah, yes, enlightenment. This Upanishad is going to point it out to us, our real nature. What, what kind of inquiry? The inquiry has already started. When it says, I am Atma Chatushpat, it says in the second verse, you see, I am Atma Chatushpat. This is the inquiry, investigation into ourselves. Upanishad says, all it's doing is pointing it out. Remember, look at yourselves. Your experience of yourself, our experience of ourselves has four aspects. Has four aspects. One aspect of our life, ourself, is when we are awake. Now, for example, here we are. There is a world before us. Here is a body. And I close my eyes, there is a thoughts and feelings. I am there and the world is there. I am a subject. Here is the object. Here is my life. This is called the waking life. I am the waker in the world of the waking, and this is my waking life. First, first aspect. Four aspects of the self. First aspect, waking. Second aspect, I fall asleep. And dreams come. Somebody said, oh, I don't dream. You just don't remember your dreams. You do dream. We mostly forget our dreams. So dreams do come. Almost everybody dreams. So dreams. I'm not aware that I'm sleeping on the bed or the couch. I feel maybe I'm walking in Boston or New York or uh, in the Bahamas and I'm meeting people and things are happening, practicing yoga. It's a dream, but it's all happening. I can see myself, I'm the dreamer and here is the world of dreams. That's the second aspect of the self. And there is a third aspect which we tend to overlook. Deep sleep. We all have the experience of blank, nothing. Just relaxed, no waking, no external world, no body, no mind even, no dreams. And it is not even an experience that I am experiencing deep sleep. Then you are not in deep sleep. <laughs> you cannot think. You cannot even have the thought of the ego. The ego also disappears. The mind shuts down. It's like a computer in, which is in hibernation. But it's all there. If you touch the mouse or just click one button, it will all come back again. Similarly, Push the guy who's in deep sleep, sound sleep. I don't know, sound sleep, maybe he's snoring. That's why sound sleep, maybe. <laughs> no, anyway, you just push the guy. He's awake. It's all there. The same personality, same thoughts, same good and bad points. Everything is there. It just comes back. But that's another ex aspect of the self. Deep sleep. These are the three aspects of the self we are conditioned. We, we know ourselves. We experience these things. Mostly we take... Oh, this waking life is the real me? And the dream is, well, you know, it's just a dream. It's just sort of hallucinations in the mind. And deep sleep is basically nothing. So this is the real thing. What Vedanta says is, you are missing, you are forgetting, you do not see the real self, which is the fourth. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep, there is a fourth and that fourth is not a separate state apart from these three. It is in and through and underlying these three, all the time present, right now also. In fact, it's the only thing that is present, and yet we are missing it. Something so extraordinarily obvious 
and yet we are missing it. What Vedanta says, we, what we need is knowledge. The pinnacle of all spiritual practices, according to Vedanta, all our devotion, our meditation, our service, our moral life, all are very good and they are all meant to ultimately bring us to this point where we realize the truth about ourselves and the universe. People call it bodhi and satori and uh, samadhi and God realization and um, so all these names. It is commonly, it, it is known throughout all the religions of the world from the very beginning of time as the highest thing that those religions can give. In Advaita Vedanta, you find it in a very pure and, and pared down, very precise way and no more precise than here. That fourth is what we are looking for. In Vedanta. The first three are known already. All of us know. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep, well known to us. Now we will investigate these waking, dreaming, deep sleep to discover the fourth. All right, I have a little time. Now I'm going to give some heavy duty uh, philosophical foundation laying. What I'm going to say. Pages and pages and have been written, volumes have been written discussing both sides of these issues. So um, if you are not trained philosophically, you're safe. If you're trained philosophically, many of the things I will say are issues of great controversy in, in different philosophical systems, not only in the West, but also in the East. Here it is. This is the foundation for what's going to come next. Knowledge, way of knowledge, but knowledge depends on what? You see, I, the awareness, in connection with the mind, experience the thoughts and feelings and emotions in the mind. I am aware with, a, with an active mind when I'm in connection with the body. Through the body and mind, I experience a world. I, by, by knowledge, by experiencing, I mean, I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, I touch, I conceive of. Uh, I remember, I understand. Also, I love and hate and want and do not want. All of this is within experience. Knowledge, it comes from the knower using a, an instrument of knowledge to produce knowledge about an object of knowledge. There are Sanskrit terms for this. The knower is called pramata, the knower. The instrument of knowledge is called pramana. The instrument of, by, by instrument of knowledge, I mean eyes are instrument of knowledge. Ears are instrument of knowledge. Uh, sense organs are instrument of knowledge. But mind also, when you are using inference. In the, so there are instruments of knowledge. And the object of knowledge is called prameyam, the thing to be known. And the knowledge which is produced is called prama. It is effortless. As easy as when you go out there on, on the, uh, the dock there, open your eyes in the morning. If you're, my, if you're awake, mind is functioning, eyes are open, you see the vast ocean, the vast blue sky above. Immediately, choicelessly you see. If the eyes are open, mind is working, you're awake, you will see. If the instrument of knowledge is there and the knower is there, object of knowledge is there, knowledge will come choicelessly. It's not a question of, you don't say, oh, I believe the sky is there. I believe the ocean is there. No. Like Jung, you will say, I know this is the ocean. I know this is the sky. Because we see it through the instrument of knowledge. Now, what I'm trying to say here is this. First controversial statement. Existence depends on knowledge. Why is this controversial? Usually we think it's the other way around. Bahamas existed. Uh, the ocean and the sky here existed. I came here and I knew it. So my knowledge comes later, existence comes first. So things are existing and then I come and know it. That's our common sense way of looking at it. I am reversing it. The Upanishad says, the first thing you got to understand is, existence depends on knowledge. What do you mean? Notice one thing. As far as dream objects are con concerned, people and objects and things which we see in dreams, they don't exist apart from your dream. True or not? 
only when you dream. You're eating, eating a pizza in, in, in your dream and it's time to wake up for the yoga class. And then do you say, do I put the pizza in the fr- uh, refrigerator after I, I'll come back and dream some more and eat the rest of the pizza? No. It will not exist without you dreaming it. Objects in our dream exist only because of our knowledge, our, our dreaming it. So they depend entirely on the dreamer, on our awareness of them. They have no independent existence. But that apart, in, you will see in the waking world, at least these objects exist independently of us. I am saying no. There is no use, no possibility, no meaning of speaking of something which is not an object of knowledge. It must become an object of knowledge to someone, somewhere, at least in principle it should be knowable. If you talk about something which exists and which can never be known, it, if you say X exists, you say what is X? I don't know. Where is X? I don't know. When is X? I don't know. Who has seen X? I don't know. Can one see X? I don't know. But I still say X exists. You say you are silly. What are you talking about? Something you can never posit, you can never claim the existence of something if it is not in some way an object of knowledge. See, but Bahamas existed. I did not see it. I'm seeing it now after I'm coming. It's an object of knowledge for me after I came. But it was there before I came. But yes, it was there as an indirect object of knowledge. You had seen it on the website. It's a nice place to go to, the Shivananda Yoga Ashram. You have not seen it directly. But you already have knowledge of it. If you did not have knowledge of it, you could not have come here. It existed as an indirect object of knowledge to you. Now it exists as an object of direct knowledge to you. Things which we do not know. Suppose there are many things which we do not know. You say, I don't know them. Something happening in some planet somewhere. Nobody living is there to see it. How can you say it it, uh, uh, does not exist? It exists as an object which is unknown to us. But as an object of but it can possibly be known, but right now I do not know any particular details about it. In that sense, it is, is an object of my exist of my knowledge. Object of awareness as known, object of awareness as unknown. But both are objects of awareness. If at all there can be no possibility of making it an object of awareness, then you cannot speak about it at all. I have made a big controversial statement to be thought about. I also always used to think that, so existence first and then knowledge. But no. I'll give you one more, a very powerful argument for this. Argument for what? Things cannot exist apart from knowledge. Things cannot exist apart from awareness. What is the argument? Very simple argument. Think about it. Two things can exist separately and independently if they can be experienced separately. Let me show you. Here is a flask and here is a piece of paper. The two can exist separately. I can show you the flask. You can experience the flask separately without the paper and you can experience the paper separately without the flask. And you can experience them together also. If you can experience them separately, you can say yes, The flask exists independent of the paper. The paper exists independent of the flask. The two are separate, independent things. So, now apply it to knowledge or awareness. What can exist independently of awareness? Remember, the principle of of existing independently is, can you experience it separately? So if the, can, is there anything that can be experienced separately apart from awareness? Is there anything in this universe which can be experienced apart from awareness? It's a trick question because when you say experienced, awareness is already included there. Without awareness, no experience is there. Without knowledge, no experience is there. So knowledge or awareness, I'm using the terms indiscriminately. Without that, you cannot have any experience. So there's no question of experiencing anything apart from awareness. Whatever has to be experienced has to be experienced in awareness. Therefore, there's no question of having anything independent of awareness. All right. Not easy to grasp, but just keep it in mind. Now we'll move faster. There's a chain of logic here. Existence of objects cannot be proved, cannot be claimed apart from knowledge. 
knowledge cannot exist without a knower. For every knowledge, there must be a knower. If there is an experience, there must be an experiencer. If there is seeing, there must be a seer. So knowledge depends on a knower. And the knower depends on awareness, consciousness. We are all knowers. What do I mean by that? We all see, hear, smell, taste, touch. We think, imagine, love, hate. All this is a kind of experience, knowledge. All of it depends on awareness. Minus awareness. See, minus other things. Without eyes, I'm still aware, but I'm aware that I'm blind. Without ears, I'm still aware, but I'm aware that I'm deaf. Without awareness, nothing. If you think about it, it just becomes blank. Nothing, it just disappears. Without awareness, there is no knower. Awareness or consciousness. Let me use the word consciousness. Now, what, what have we got here? Things do not exist apart from knowledge. Knowledge does not exist apart from the knower. Knower does not exist apart from consciousness. Consciousness is fundamental to knower and known. Knower, knowledge known, or at least knower and known. Knower, knowledge known, if you say use, that is the Sanskrit word is triputi, the three points of knowledge. Knower, knowledge, and the known. Or simply, knower and known, subject and object, they both depend on consciousness. One more brick for the building block which I'm making, the foundation. If something depends on something else and cannot exist independently, this is called falsity. In Vedanta, Vedanta term falsity, a thing is false or mithya, does not mean that it does not exist. It does not exist independently. A classic example is given, heat of the fire. So you have a hot potato, it's boiling. Does the heat belong to the potato? No, it was cold earlier and if you keep it outside for a long time, it will become cold again. Heat does not belong to the potato. The heat of the potato is borrowed. It not, does not belong to it. It's false there. It just appears there. But it, why did, where did it get it from? Boiling water. Does the boiling water have heat of its own? No, it was cold earlier. Now it's hot, but it'll be cold later. Where did it get heat from? From the pan. Does the pan have heat of its own? No unless it's an electric pan or something. No, it doesn't have heat of its own. It gets heat from the fire uh, underneath. So the heat which is in the pan and in the water and in the potato, borrowed. Vedanta calls it false, in the sense that it cannot exist by itself. But the fire, does it have heat of its own? Yes. As long as the fire exists, with the way we understand fire, it must be hot. So it, it has intrinsic heat. It has intrinsic heat, not borrowed heat. So the intrinsic existence, it belongs to consciousness. It does not belong to the knower or the known. Both the known and the knower, they depend on consciousness. Because they depend on consciousness, neither knower nor known is real. It's not intrinsically real. Consciousness alone is intrinsically real. The duality of knower and known, they appear in awareness and disappear in awareness or in consciousness. They are not real in themselves. Now the connection to what I was saying will become obvious now. This knower and known, they come in pairs, knower and known, subject and object. Notice, in the waking world, we are there, you are the knower, and this is known. Remember, as I said, none of it is new. It's all what we are experiencing. We're just pointing it out. Right now, you are the knower, and this world is your known. In dreams, you are the knower, the dreamer, the knower, and whatever you dream about is the known for you. In deep sleep, there is no separate knower. Knower and known are merged together in a, in a uh, unity. And there's just this blankness. Let's just call it the known, that blankness known. So you have a deep sleeper and which knows only blankness. Just complete cessation. In each case, knower and known, they are all these pairs, knower and known pairs are false. The reality underneath is this consciousness. Three, three knowers and three pairs and three knowns. Three knowers, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. And three, three knowables, waking world, the dream world, and the deep sleep darkness. They all appear and disappear one after another in one reality which lies underneath all of them, and that is consciousness. So that consciousness is the fourth. The self has four aspects. What are the three aspects? Waker and waker's world. Dreamer and dreamer's world. Deep sleeper and deep sleep darkness. 
all three are known to us. What the Upanishad is pointing out, there is a fourth. The fourth is the reality in which these three appear and disappear. And that is what is going to be pointed out. One more point. The waker's world is called the gross or the physical world. Here, we have the feeling there is a world out there. And with my sense organs, I am contacting the world out there. I am transacting with the world out there. This is called the gross world. Gross, not in an American sense. <laughs> Americans have a different meaning for gross. In a physical sense, physical world or gross world. And then we have a dream world, which is a subtle world, sukshma. And then we have the deep sleep world, which is technically called the causal world, the causal state. Cause, causal, not casual. The causal state. So three, karana, sukshma, stula. Causal, subtle, and gross. Waking, the deep sleep, dream state, and uh, the, the waking state. All these three states, they are all in maya. And what underlies these three states is the Atman, the pure consciousness, which we really are, the fourth aspect of the uh, self. So this is going to be our inquiry. I know that's a lot to be going on. Don't lose sleep over it. Go into the deep sleep state. We will go over it again and again uh, in the next few uh, classes. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat.